Well, let's begin with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful, and kindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your Spirit, and they shall be created. And thou shalt renew the, the face of the earth. earth. O Lord, who enlightens the hearts of your faithful by the light of the Holy Spirit, grant that in the same Spirit we may be truly wise, and ever enjoy his consolation through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Our Lady, help of Christians, pray, pray for us. us. And St. Thomas More, pray, pray for us. us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Great. Well, today's uh, topic is coping with failure, something that we all know something about, and certainly something that uh, if one of our friends knows something about, and we experience it as a regular part of our human existence. Failure is really a, um, you might say, a secular term for the, the ultimate failure in our lives, which is coping with sin. And so when we look at uh, coping with failure, we look into, say, the scriptures, and we see that there's untold examples, a uh, number of examples, of, uh, of failure. And we look at our first parents, Adam and Eve, put in the Garden of Eden, which in uh, I think it's in Aramaic, means delight. So it's a place of happiness. And what happens? Things are fine for a while, and then there is a failure there. You know, they don't trust God. They don't, they fail their test, so to speak. Um, how did they cope with it? How did God cope with it? Um, we see the, the failure of the first two brothers, you know, the, the first fratricide, Cain and Abel. And, <coughs> excuse me, and we see that we see continual examples of failures in the history of the people of Israel. The greatest failure of the people of Israel was ultimately a failure of keeping to the covenant. And of all the different sins that we see in the scriptures, all the different sins against the Ten Commandments, but ultimately, and although they're frequently written up as being a failure of uh, like a chastity failure, a, a sexual immorality, it's ultimately any turning to a false god which always ended up being an unfaithfulness to the covenant. But before we go into some of these actual stories, let's just first of all break down the words. So coping with failure. So coping, you know, what does it mean to cope? Uh, because we've all got various different ideas of uh, what coping means. And it's a bit like love, you know, you do a survey of a hundred people what love means and you'll, well, you won't get a hundred different, completely different versions of it. But for instance, one of the two things that we don't associate together with love is that love is involved sacrifice. You know, very many people will attach to love that it's pleasurable, it's enjoyable, it's wonderful, we, we uh, get life out of it. But we also, the other side of love is that it frequently disappoints us. And we'll talk about failure in that area of, uh, of our lives. So coping, as I'm going to define it, is being able to sift through the issue that we, or issues at hand and being able to move on. Coping, therefore, doesn't mean that the failure just goes away or somehow or other the pain is no longer there but failure means that I've accepted what I've gone through, this is my situation at the moment, and what am I going to do with it? How am I going to continue living uh, my life in this situation? Now some people's way of coping is, it doesn't matter, it's not there. Some people's way of coping is, they'll drink themselves silly, some will inject themselves with some drug, and fewer people will actually sit down and say what has actually gone on and how can I actually learn from it, what did I do wrong, and actually do a bit of an analysis. But even more than that, there's a necessity to enter into our own emotional lives because failure is something that registers upon us uh, emotionally. One time I was talking to a friend of mine when I was overseas, and we were talking about pain. And pain you know, has, again, different forms. But very often we associate it with like a medical, a physical sort of pain. 
and he said, but the, and the physical pain, we tend to ignore that a lot, I mean, because we want to medicate it. But the other kind of pain that we experience as human beings is the pain of, say, boredom, or a pain of just meaninglessness. That is a pain that we as human beings are uniquely able to do. I don't look at my friend's guinea pigs and watch them there thinking, oh, I'm bored, you know, I'm, I'm uh, having a meaningless day today. But people do, and we can't medicate that kind of uh, pain. And that is also a certain kind of failure. So coping with failure, coping always means somehow being able to work our way through what it is. And there's authentic ways of coping and inauthentic ways of coping. The other quick fleeting examples I gave, you know, drinking ourselves silly, you know, see, seeking a quick fix, seeking at drugs, whatever it is, you know, cash therapy. Have you heard that expression before? I came across that when I was working in America, you know, cash therapy when you're feeling a bit down and so forth, go spend some money. It'll give you a nice lift, you know, well, maybe it'll help some people, but it might get you into further debt. I don't know. But, uh, you know, that's ultimately not going to be the solution to coping with failure. And then the other thing to ask, failure, again, has many definitions. And why am I making a, a point of labouring that we actually have a common understanding of the words is because without a common understanding of the words, the terms, then definitions, without definitions, the meaning will keep on shifting and it becomes the always elusive moving target. So failure is a, an inability to reach a target. Just very simply defined. Failure is an inability to reach a target. So, I've missed my mark. If you want to uh, define that in another language, uh, let me give you one, hamartia, which is the Greek word for sin, which actually comes from missing the mark. An archer striving for his target or her target and just missing that spot. Whenever we miss the mark that we have aimed for, whatever it happens to be, then there is some kind of a failure. And obviously some failures are more minor, other failures are more severe, and other failures are catastrophic. So we'll get to some of those and different failures in a minute. Another thing too to bear in mind is that failure can also be, so there's a an inability to reach the mark, the target that I was aiming for. There's also a failure that depends on perspective. For example, if, uh, let me think, if your younger brother or sister, let's say, I don't know how many of you or who among you has a brother or sister who's five or six years old, and they say to you, you know, Jack, Bob, whatever, you are the best person in the world. You know, it'll warm your heart up, it will you know, make you feel good, you'll give them a hug and you'll think, aren't you sweet, that's great. But if one of your close friends says that to you, it means something else, doesn't it? I mean, you'll hear it, but it will have a different reaction upon you. If one of your professors pulled you aside from class one day and says, you know what, I see such potential in you that you, know, you can really go far in the academic sphere, whatever field you're studying in. Because of who says what to you, it makes a different impact on you. And it's the same with failure. Now, let's see, choose another thing now. So that I was just talking there about success. Failure. If a total stranger comes up to you and says, you know, you're a poor excuse for a human being. You say, get lost or whatever. You know, you might say something that's not very charitable, but you'll say something to them and, and it won't affect you too much. Or at least I hope it won't affect you too much. But if it's, again, a good friend, or if it's your father or mother, whom you've been trying to impress for a long time, and they say to you, you are such an unworthy son or daughter. Ugh. You know, that would kill you. 
Or at least it should, or it should hurt, because it's someone you look up to, someone who has led you from nothingness into where you are now. One of the things I remember when I, uh, the night before I was ordained, I knelt down for my parents' blessing. It was about 11 p.m., something like that. And I said, look, Mum, Dad, I'm going to get ordained tomorrow. I want your blessing, you know. Not that I didn't have it, but... And then my father said something to me that was very complimentary. And I thought, I always sensed it from him, but I had never actually heard it. And at that moment, he said it. And I thought, wow, you could have knocked me over with a feather. You know, it was just really felt very deeply touched. Why? Because he had said it to me. And I loved him dearly. I still do, even though he's been absent on the earth for however many years. But, you see, whoever says various things to us, they can make or break us. So when we're talking about coping with failure, it actually depends a lot also, not the missing of the target, depending a lot on in whose eyes have we failed or in whose eyes have we succeeded. Now, we want to look at the, just developing this understanding a little bit more, the perspective of the, in whose eyes we have failed or we have succeeded. On a human level, what would you think is the greatest failure in the history of the world? What do you think would be the greatest failure in the history of the world? This is not a Christian university, but if it were, you'd find crucifixes all over the walls. Or at least you should, anyway, at least some sign of Christianity. The crucifixion of the Son of God from a human level is the greatest, most complete failure in the history of the world. Because God sends His Son into the world on a human level, right? I'm talking about it. He sends His Son into the world, has an amazing short ministry, miracles, great teaching, a great following, and in the end, all his friends abandon him, or at least most of them. That is a failure in terms of what are you trying to set up. But on a supernatural level, which is a totally different level, but builds on the natural. So supernatural, super, superare comes from the Latin, so above the natural, but builds on it. On the supernatural level is the greatest victory ever. The death which leads to the resurrection of Christ. And this is beautifully captured in the Mel Gibson film, The Passion of the Christ. Um, was that in 2004, 2005, something like that? Anyway, I'll say 2004. But, uh, and the scene there where Jesus had just died and the camera just goes down, and you might recall, those of you who have seen the film, that throughout the film there's a parallel going on, particularly throughout the actual passion itself. So Jesus is walking to his, uh, his death, there's his mother, but then there's this figure, this androgynous figure. It was actually a woman, they, the actress, they shaved her eyebrows to try and make her look neither male nor female. And she was the symbol of the evil one. And then, so the picture goes straight from the, the head of the crucified Christ and goes down to his feet. And then you see the devil just screaming out, realizing what I've done. I have managed to get the enemies of the Son of God against him to bring about his death, thinking that by executing him and bringing about failure in that sense, I have actually brought about what I didn't want to. The redemption of the world. And failure is very much like this. On a human level, and we're going to cope with it on a human level, we're going to talk about coping with it on a human level, and on a supernatural level. And you can see where I'm going to be heading, because ultimately there's something that comes from the supernatural level that on the human level alone cannot come. So the failure it very much depends on, on whose eyes we're looking at things, and very often we can learn things from that. But also, for instance, we can spend a lot of our lives 
actually trying to appear as many a child or has, has done with his or her parents, trying to impress parents or impress bosses at work or impress colleagues, trying to reinvent ourselves so that we can be acceptable and be a success and realizing or failing to realize that in fact that person is never going to be pleased. Because some people are just like that. They never look in the mirror long enough to see who am I actually seeing. So that question I really ask you to keep it very much in mind. Whenever you experience failure, in whose eyes am I a failure? Or have I failed in something? Now ultimately, if we're saying we're acknowledging this as some kind of a personal failure, whatever it's in, whether it's in the area of relationships, business, our studies, area of life in general, being able to just make ends meet in the world and, and to actually have interactions mixed with social groups, whatever it is, or the ultimate failure, which is in the area of our spiritual life, Whatever it happens to be, ultimately, every failure is somehow seen as a participation of oneself in this whole thing. So let's keep going then. So, okay, so now I've acknowledged that I have failed in something or other. Yes, in so-and-so's eyes, maybe I haven't been a failure. In so-and-so's eyes, I have. In mine, I think I've actually got some kind of responsibility. How do I actually start to go towards coping with it? Well, firstly, to admit what I have done. To actually acknowledge what I have done. Now, it depends. If it's something very simple, you know, I failed to study for an exam, and that's why I failed. That's very easy to admit, because we see it. But if, for instance, I studied, and actually studied hard for an exam, or a, some other kind of test, and I still did poorly, now, it's not because I haven't actually tried or haven't, you know, given it my best shot. Now, maybe there's refinements that I could actually take into account. But, you know, I have to admit, you know, maybe I just don't have the talent that it takes to do this particular course. So maybe I have to admit something about myself that is actually very difficult for me to admit. Because... There's, I actually may like the material or like a particular part. And I have to examine that in myself. I have to look in my heart. And this is where I'd encourage everybody to, in prayer and in stillness, not with music going on, not with distractions, to sit inside with ourselves, with Christ, particularly in front of the Blessed Sacrament if it's possible, to just enter into ourselves. And entering into that place of darkness, not alone, but with Him, we're able to say, Why do I see as this? What is actually, what was my deep longing? What is the real cause? Because sometimes the reasons that will occur to us in the beginning are not actually legitimate reasons. I remember a talk that Cardinal Freeman, a former Archbishop of Sydney, gave to me in the seminary at the time, this was back in 1990, so none of you almost were born, except one anyway, so that's, that's great. Two, two, so, I'll beg your pardon, sorry, sorry. Two of you have been born, this is great. Uh, but, you know what he said to us, and I, I'll never forget it, I was 20 years old, and I'm looking at, and he's saying, he's giving examples of a seminary and that sort of thing, because, uh, you know, we were all seminarians, and he said, Think of the seminarian, you know, who comes and he, you know, he has a go at his studies, but he, uh, he doesn't, he's distracted. And, and he does badly. And then he thinks, oh, you know, I'm not really good at this. And then he has another exam, and, but he hasn't really applied himself and concentrated. And he doesn't do too well, or he just passes that one. And this happens three or four times, and he begins to question his vocation. In fact, his vocation had nothing to do with actually being called or not to the priesthood. He's judging his vocation based on his academic results and failing to acknowledge that, in fact, it's come about because he hasn't concentrated. Concentrated. And he just gave a very simple example of how an inability to concentrate and apply ourselves 
will yield sometimes terrible results, more or less, depending on the situation, because application of oneself does require a concentration. So when we're looking for the deeper reasons, then we need to actually be very honest with ourselves. Now, this is where it can get messy, because the human mind operates, and I talked about this in the talk last year on the, the conscious, subconscious, and the unconscious mind. The human mind operates on three different levels. The, you know, that, those three levels I just mentioned. And Sigmund Freud, the well-known psychologist, analytic psychologist, um, developed, uh, even though he had some crazy views on religion and atheistic views as well. But I think he was right when he talks about the ways in which the human mind operates. Very often, when there are deep personal truths about ourselves that we don't like to admit, the mind will do amazing tricks to prevent us from acknowledging them, on the one hand. On the other hand, those truths will want to come out. So they might come to us in dreams, for instance, or you know, in just a moment of intuition. But if we are not looking for them, then we will constantly keep pushing them down. Other things are so painful or so, I don't know, embarrassing is the word to, to use, but they're so, I'll, I'll stick with painful, they're so unwanted for us that they are what we call repressed repressed memory. And those things are unconscious. So we may actually be operating in various things of our lives, under various things, in various projects, under various impulses that are actually unknown to us. And those impulses will lead us to various, whatever, to do various things, to various behaviors. But in those behaviors, for some reason, we're always running up against the same thing and we're failing in that particular thing. And why? Because we're not actually looking at them very deeply. Now what actually can help us in these things? Well, seeking spiritual direction is a great help. But it's not the only form. Seeking some good counseling, or maybe some work with a psychologist. Because a well-trained psychologist, particularly a psychotherapist or a clinical psychotherapist, has training in accessing the unconscious mind. But that's one avenue. You know, in spiritual direction, a lot of the work that I've done, certainly other spiritual directors I know have done, they're constantly listening to the person, but they're listening to what is also not being said. And when we're coming to uncover various causes within ourselves, that lead us to fail in one thing or another, then it requires us to come to a deeper awareness of the truth about ourselves. And that awareness of the truth doesn't come easy. Sometimes, in fact, certain aspects about ourselves, knowledge about ourselves, comes precisely because we've failed in reaching a target. Whether the target was overly ambitious, whether the target was actually pretty simple, at least on the surface. But when I finally got into it, I realized it was just overwhelming, whatever it happens to be. And this friend of mine, when I was in America, we were talking about a, a mutual friend, and he said to me, you know, person X will only hear you when he experiences deep failure. And I just thought to myself, wow. Because it was a person who was very gifted, and the more gifted somebody is, and please stock this in the back of your minds, because a lot of you are very gifted. The more gifted a person is, the more tools he or she has at their disposal to cover up their weaknesses. Now, again, our culture tells us, you know, the only successful people are people who, are, you know, are popular, or people who make a deep impact. Uh, on society and so forth, you know, and many of you would be aware of um, Bob Hawke's death um, reported in the news yesterday at the age of 89. And in certain ways, 
he, like all human beings, was very successful, and he, perhaps more than most. But in other ways, he also had failures. And they're known to him and God, and perhaps his own, only his closest family. But the more gifts somebody has, the more tools they have and techniques to cover up their own weakness. Or if I could use a biblical statement, to cover up their nakedness. What did Adam and Eve do once their eyes were open? They'd eaten from the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They now realize they're naked. And they realize now there's something wrong or odd with this. They go to hide themselves. They see God walking in the cool of the evening. And in fact, a, a very deep study of this passage would yield that there was actually God was trying to speak to them. And now, because they had ruptured their relationship with God, they're no longer open to hear Him. So when we're really trying to look at coping with failure, we've also got to, in accepting what the failure is, to make sure that we're actually basing our response on the truth of our situation, we have to dig deeply inside. And digging deeply inside, to do that on our own, is very, very difficult. What's another way in which we can actually look at ourselves or have mirrors for ourselves? And it's actually those who love us the most. Notice I say, those who love us the most, not those whom we love. Because we may love a whole lot of people, but those people don't love us back, necessarily. But those who actually love us, not only will build us up, in fact they'll always try to build us up except when they lose their temper and they you know, <laughs> tear us down in some way, but those who love us will tell us what we don't want to hear. And this is the costliness of really growing through the failure. So the being able to cope with our failures in life, whatever areas they happen to be in, it will always involve, okay, how am I going to move through this? And if my way of saying moving through is just to put it to one side and not work on it. I'm here, I'm not talking about just light little failures, but the deeper kinds of failures. Then I will not grow. And what will I do? I'll repeat them again. So failure is actually meant to be God's way Ultimately, now this is looking at the supernatural side of things, God's way of teaching us our strengths and our limits. Our strengths come from God, but our limits, He has left us like that. Why is it that God gives to someone an amazing ability at engineering? But to, but to that same person, they can't put two words together. Or another person has an amazing ability for phrases and writing wonderful stories. And yet, when it comes to giving a talk, they feel very awkward. Another person has a heart so big that can serve whoever. Nothing you ask of them is too much. And then you go to praise them publicly, and they go to water. Because they're so self-conscious. Well, that's not a normal reaction. Why is that? Because God gives nobody all of the gifts. He will give some various gifts and some a lot of gifts. And the more gifts that there are, the more dangerous it can become. What is the greatest failure that we know of in terms of one of God's creatures who was supremely gifted, who got carried away with his gifts? What name? Devil. The devil, Lucifer, the most splendid of all of God's creatures, who thought, wow, actually fell in love with himself, you know, in the bad sense of the word. So good old narcissism struck well before Narcissus, so the, the Greek mythology, ever came into the whole thing. But, you know, he thought, gee, I, I'm pretty cool. And he must have been pretty impressive also for the others, other angels, because he led, you know, tradition tells us, about a third. 
and that's for the image in the book of the Apocalypse. We don't actually exactly know, right? The book of the Apocalypse says that uh, the, the devil, the, the dragon rather, dragged a third of the stars from the heavens to the earth. And this has been interpreted as being a, uh, an indication of how many of the demons, of the angels, that Satan actually managed to convince to rebel against God. I mean, so you'd have to be pretty impressive because, you know, God's pretty impressive, even though at that point they didn't have his, the beatific vision. They couldn't see the glory and splendor of God, but their superior intelligence certainly enabled them to see, uh, to see what was going on and, and the test. So, you know, an abysmal failure and unwillingness to look at himself properly. And he fell in love with himself and forgot that he was actually a creature. How are we going with time? Okay, good. Now, one of the things that in Christian tradition that we've often, well, may or may not have heard about is when, you know, good things or bad things happen to good people. And, you know, interpreting whether or not something that has happened in our life is actually cause of our own failure to do something or caused by something else. Because there are various failures in our life. I mean, a person who constantly is trying to do various things to improve, to get, you know, the, the person who's trying to get a job, keep it, earn enough money, pay for their rent, pay for their food, their water, their gas, whatever, electricity, and something always keeps going wrong. And that person can think, well, am I doing something or failing to do something? Or is God doing something? And St. Thomas Aquinas, at least I remember, I don't know if anyone else around his time was also saying this, would talk about the deliberative will of God and the permissive will of God. So the deliberative will of God is that God actually intends something very deliberately. It is his express will. God intends this particular thing. So God intends that we will all be saved. God intends that we, you know, have a happy life. God intends that we love one another. God intends that we forgive one another and so forth. But then there's the permissive will of God, which refers to things that God permits because he is going to draw good from them down the track. So typically they're evil things. Why did God permit an Adolf Hitler to come to power? I'm sure many, a Jew and a Christian in Second World War and since, has asked this. I mean, Adolf Hitler, had he died in probably 1937 or something like that, before the annexation of, uh, of Austria in 38, probably would have gone down, more than likely would have gone down, as one of the greatest Germans in, in the German history. I mean, the autobahns, various other inventions, the Volkswagen, was invented there, you know, the people's car, and a whole lot of other in innovations to a country that was coming out of terrible tragedy after World War I. And I'm not a, no expert in German history, but you think, wow, what's happened there? Well, God in his infinite wisdom, and from all of creation, from before the dawn of creation, knew that Hitler would be, you know, and turn out to be this terrible dictator, he permitted this. He knew before he made Lucifer and all the angels that some of them would rebel against him. He wanted to give them the chance to love him or to reject him. And God will allow this, the same thing to all human beings. However, has God lost control of the situation when evil happens? Absolutely not. God is the only one who is powerful enough to actually bring good out of evil. And he will allow the Hitlers, the Mao Zedongs, the Stalings, the you know various other dictators that are in the world today, and uh, and he will allow them, and they allow them to cause suffering to people, and in some cases untold suffering, because God is actually working mysteriously through that. I mean, even now, for instance, I was just listening um, recently to a a little uh, 
YouTube clip about a missionary who had gone and done some missionary work in China. And uh, anyway, these people, the group in China was a Protestant evangelical group, and they had spent, I think, three days in China and to evangelize and, and work with these, these missionary leaders. And the, the leaders, uh, they were Americans, they'd gone over there, you know, all under secrecy, of course. And he said to the leaders, what would happen if uh, we are caught when he's doing this? He said, oh, they'll deport you tomorrow back to your country. What would happen if you are caught being here? There were about 30-odd people at this kind of seminar. They were sitting on, uh, not on chairs, they were sitting on the floor in this room for three days, just talking about the Word of God and, and hearing about Jesus Christ. He said, oh, if we get caught, we'll be sent to prison. We'll be sent to prison. And, and these guys, the, the teachers, were just in amazement of, of this dedication that you would risk getting thrown into prison because you love your faith. You love Jesus Christ. And then later on, when they're getting ready to go, the, the Chinese Christians were asking the American Christians, uh, we'll pray that one day we may be like you. Because, you know, we'll be able to worship in freedom. I mean, you know, they said in America, we can go to our churches every Sunday and pray and worship and nobody touches us and, and we're completely free and so forth. And so they're saying, oh, we pray that we may be like you. And then the missionaries said, no, I pray that we may be like you. You know, some of these people had walked for several days to come to this particular secret location where they could have these three days of catechesis. They're risking imprisonment because of their faith. They're not sitting in comfortable chairs and heated churches as so many of the churches are in America. You know, in, in Australia, we don't need to heat our churches so much, our cold is not that bad. But, you know, and yet, so many of our churches are empty. We've got all these freedoms, but we don't value them. These people don't have them, and they're fighting hard for them. So, what enabled them to do this? Well, precisely because of there's a, a dark regime that is communistic in variation, various forms, and is creating a persecution. Under persecution, even though on the one level it's evil, it's immoral, and it needs to be opposed in whatever way it can be, it also often brings out of people tremendous greatness. In World War II, the dark days of Nazi the occupation of Europe brought about so many great people. Great saints, Maximilian Kolbe, Edith Stein, and lots of others that we won't hear about until we get to eternity. So, why does God permit evil so he can bring good out of it? I pray that eventually he will convert those who actually bring about a lot of the evil, just like Saul was doing to uh, the early Christians, and uh, God the Father revealed to Saint Catherine of Siena in her book, The, the Dialogue, he uh, reveals to her that in fact, Simon Stephen's death and his martyrdom was the very sacrifice that was necessary to bring about the conversion of Saul. And what was the sacrifice necessary to bring about the conversion of the world? The death of the Son of God. You know, the, the worst tragedy on the human level, uh, God you know, allowed his own Son, the most pure, the most innocent, the most holy, to suffer so unjustly a death like that, in order to bring about and unleash God's goodness and mercy upon the world. So the permissive and the deliberative will of God, they're good categories to help us understand in the immediate situation what we may be going through in life. Because sometimes we just suffer for no reason of our own. And we can give ourselves the pious answer, or somebody can give us the pious answer, or oh, just offer it up, you know, it'll do you lots of good, whatever you think. You say that to me one more time, I'm going to scream, you know. And, and it's nice, and it's true, but it's just, 
okay, you're just dismissing that I'm going through this time of pain. Maybe saying to me, you know what, Mark, I'm sorry to hear that you're in this situation, and I'm with you. Oh, thank you. You know, I'm not alone. Because in suffering and failure, one of the things that often strikes us is that we feel isolated. When we overcome that isolation, we actually feel stronger and we're able also to move on. That can be one of the things that helps us to move on. Saturday night, I had a conversation with a gentleman who uh, was contemplating suicide. He was 54 years old. And I'm not sure if I shared this story with some of you, but it was, anyway, just walked in after Mass. And, and of course, as, as it would be, I was in a rush to go somewhere else. And I thought, oh, of all times you want to come in and talk to me. Anyway, then he started opening up his heart, and I'm thinking, God, I'm worrying about going to dinner somewhere. And you brought this man in front of me to tell me he was thinking about suicide. He'd actually tried four times and failed, thank God. But, you know, he's 54, and he started telling me the story of his life. One tragedy after another. He was abused sexually. He was abused physically. He was treated badly by his family so forth. And then he says, no, there's nothing worth for me to live for. And I took him by the shoulder and said, there is something for you to live for. I am glad you are here tonight. And we ended up praying and, and, and it was good. I gave him a number if he wanted to talk in the middle of the night. But I, uh, that man had felt like he was a failure. And we didn't have time to go into enough of the details of his life to see what he could have done differently or not. But there were enough things happening to him from the outside to make him think and feel, my life is not worth living. And his life is worth living. He needs help. He needs direction. And that's why it's important when we are feeling like a failure, particularly something very dark that's happened to us, to reach out to somebody who loves us, who can touch us, and lead us back into a place of freedom and a place where uh, of um, com communion, where we're not in isolation. Okay, a couple more minutes, and then we'll wrap up. The okay, so I want to talk two more things. I mean, in the Bible, there's so many stories of failure, right? I mean, there's one of the stories I really love is David's story because David's story is failure. But then there's redemption. You know, David knew he was the greatest king of Israel, um, obviously before Jesus ever came, and he knew how to sin, and when he fell, he fell hard, but he also knew how to repent. And David didn't muck around when it came to facing things squarely. He felt them squarely, he faced them squarely, and then he went on. The um, other examples, uh, other kings in the history of Israel, did not face things squarely. And even when they were confronted by the various prophets, they didn't want to admit them. For instance, you've got uh, Elijah talking to King Ahab and for his own misdeeds. He didn't want to hear it. He wanted to basically get rid of him, but Jezebel was trying to do that, his wife, you know. So we have different examples. Both had been failures. One had admitted it, and David grew from strength to strength and ends up being, you know, 70 years of age, and he's a great man. King Ahab, we don't know what happened to him. And there were lots of bad kings in the history of Israel. And God permitted all of that. But I say these things because when we are able to face squarely our failures, we're able to grow through them. When we don't, it's, it's the end. It's, it's Well, we just keep repeating the various things. So two final points. One is the cost of failure and its lessons. And then the cost of success and its lessons. The cost of failure in all the different possibilities of our lives is always some kind of a death. Now, it's not a physical death. It's an existential death. Something where we could have reached a potential somehow was not reached. There's a failure to reach a potential. Now, as we get older in life, we begin to realize more and more accurately our potentials, our abilities, what we can do or not do. 
some of our wild dreams that we had when we were children about ourselves, we realize they're just wild dreams. You know? and, and then as we get older, then we realize what we're capable of and also then what we're not capable of. In other words, we become more realistic. As we get older as well, one of the things that we realize is that our choices actually narrow. I don't know if I could have ever been an astronaut when I was 20, but who knows, maybe I could have gone for that and shot for the moon and see where I would have ended up. I certainly can't be an astronaut now. It's just not an option in my life. No matter what I did, no matter how much sacrifice I put into it, I cannot be that. So, and I don't use this as an example of a failure. I mean, that was a, a choice that I made to go into my particular vocation and to enter into that whenever the age that I was. But when we have failures, we realize what they cost us. Whether it's the shame, the difficulties, the scar tissue, so to speak, and we need to learn those lessons. And the lessons are, okay, do I want this to happen again? What do I need to do differently? And then in terms of the cost of success, if we really want to succeed in life, I mean, it talks about coping with failure, but I want to finish on a positive note, that the cost of success is usually a heck of a lot. A heck of a lot. And whether it's success in a career, success in a business, success in one's family. I know a gentleman who's wealthy as two children, lots of properties, a couple of businesses running, but his marriage is. And I feel like saying to him, you don't need more money. Invest your time and your energy to be a success in the family. But being a success in the family is a lot harder than being a success in the business world. And or than being a success in theatre or being a success, a success in something else. Because there's a lot of energy has been put into that. Success in the family is a messy business. Success in relationships requires very much a confrontation with ourselves, which are some of the things that I was really referring to earlier on. And the ultimate success is eternal life. That's the ultimate success that we should work for constantly, constantly. And, you know, sometimes, if we're going to be truthful about it, we strive very much for eternal life. We work towards it. And other times... We just don't. I'll speak of myself, you know. Sometimes I don't want to act like a friend of Christ. I want to, don't, I just don't want to sacrifice anymore. I want to have a, an easy day or, or whatever the, the, the case happens to be. But I don't want to always work to that. Now why is that? Because there's sin inside me, there's broken, there's scar tissue, there's the, the wound of original sin, the concupiscence, all of that. But... That's the struggle. And so when we're talking about the cost of success, if we want to be ultimately successful in our lives, we've got to prepare ourselves for the success of eternal life. And, and what are its lessons? Its lessons are the same. The cross, forgiveness, perseverance, self-discipline, the other virtues, you know, the things that you already know. So I'll leave it at that. Um, couple of questions or, or minutes if uh, for any questions that you may have, otherwise we'll wrap it up.